safely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. I pray, Lord, none of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, guys, let's put our hands together and give the Lord a big hand clap of praise tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Well, turn and greet two or three of your neighbors, and you can be seated tonight, and we'll get right into this. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of uh, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, and I want to begin at verse 9, and it's going to be extremely radical tonight. And I just got to be honest with you, I want to teach this tonight because I'm, I really just got fed up hearing people, they go back and forth with this thing. And I was trying to be real nice and generous about it but now I'm going to be radical about it, okay? And we're going to talk about, do you have to confess your sins in order for God to forgive you? Because every preacher I know now is saying, you got to confess it, that's how you get rid of it. Well, if I got to confess my sins, that's how you get rid of it, then forgiveness is now going to be dependent on something I have to do instead of being dependent on something that Jesus has already done. Is there a place for confession? Of course it is, but it is never going to be to get your sins forgiven, okay? And so I want to go through that and be somewhat radical with it uh, and yet be a t teacher of the Scripture so that you can understand exactly what that means because if you start making a doctrine around 1 John 1 and 9, confessing your sins, then you're going to be confessing something all the time and still going to forget some stuff. Okay? And that's just one of those religious things that makes, that makes it just crazy trying to be a Christian when somebody keeps telling you stuff like that. And so I want, I want us to deal with it. I want us to deal with it intelligently. I want us to deal with it from the Scripture and from a scriptural basis. And I'm not going to try to convince you of something. I want to allow the Scriptures to do that. Okay? So I want to start off with 1 John 1 and 9 and then go back to verse 1. And, of course, context is king. So the application of verse 9 is going to be based on the context of it. The application of any Scripture is going to be based on the context that that Scripture appears in. So let's read verse 9, first of all. And uh, uh, he says, uh, uh, 1 John 1 and 9. He says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of you are aware of that scripture? If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if you just read that out of his context, what does it sound like? In order to get rid of your sins, you got to confess them. And what it sounds like is, if you confess your sins, condition, if you confess your sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. If you don't confess your sins, is he still faithful? Yes. Because his faithfulness is not going to be based on whether or not I confess my sins or not. All right. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Now, did he forgive our sins 2,000 years ago, or is he only going to forgive them when you confess them today? and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Haven't we read in Hebrews chapter 10 that he has already cleansed us once and for all of all unrighteousness? All right, now, so the first thing we got to figure out is, was this meant for sinners who have not made Jesus the Lord of their lives, or was it meant for believers who have made Jesus the Lord of their lives? Now, I'll agree with this for sinners because I know in order for me to get saved, for all of us to get saved, we've confessed our sins, right? And he was faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins, and he cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Every one of us have experienced that. But now, if you try to use this as 
of Scripture to define what it means to maintain fellowship with Jesus or to say that a Christian person has to do this all the time, that's where I'm having the problem. So, as far as my study is concerned, chapter, chapter 1 of 1 John, chapter 1, was written to agnostics. These were people who were not believers. They were unbelievers. And then in chapter 2, you will see him talking about believers. So, I want to handle it in context first, and then I want to deal with some obvious things that you have learned. You know, I feel like I'm talking to you right now, and you're like, you ain't got to preach this to us. We already know where this is going to end up. But for the benefit of mama and them, pookie and them, and, and shakweed and them, I want to supply a teaching so that you can use and say, child, please listen to this and call me tomorrow, okay? Because I don't know if you realize it, but if you go to almost 80% of Christians right now, they believe they have to confess their sins every single day to get God to do something about it every single day. And if they don't, they don't have fellowship with God, and they may die with unconfessed sins. And that's the thing we've got to settle. So I thought to get you to help me to preach this particular gospel, why not go through it tonight and really lay hold of some things. So now let's begin at verse 1, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who's he talking about here? These are the disciples here who spent time with Jesus, who heard him speak, who, who had fellowship with him, and they're talking. And, and, and I want you to realize in verse 1, He's got to be talking to somebody about Jesus. Imagine if you were going and witnessing to somebody, and they came out and said, you know, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. Look at verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and we bear witness, and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Who's he talking about there? Can you see this, these people? They're sitting up here talking about what they have experienced and what they witnessed. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Now, do you see that? That which we have seen, which we have heard, we are now declaring unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. So the assumption is you don't have fellowship with us because we can, we can ready to tell you something about something you didn't know about. But we know about it. We've seen it. We've experienced it. So that you may have, we did, now we're declaring it to you. So what we've experienced and seen, we're not declaring it to you. So it's obvious not declaring to someone who's, who's, who's had the same experience. So obviously this is someone who hadn't had this experience that they have had. We're now declaring unto you that you also may have fellowship or kononia or may participate or have a part with this as well. <clears throat> and truly our fellowship is with the Father <clears throat> and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So he says you don't have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, like we do. So now we're declaring this to you so you can have the fellowship with the Son and the Father like we do. Sounds like somebody witnessing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, look at verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. The implication is like our joy is full. Look at verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and now we declare it unto you that God is what? Light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Verse, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, if I say that I have fellowship or I have a part with him, notice what happened when I got born again. I got in him. I got in the light. The light is not behavior. The light is your position in him. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, so I am in him. And now I am, I'm, I'm walking. So if I say that I have fellowship with him, or if I say I'm in him, and then I walk in darkness, then we lie and do not the truth because I'm not in him. Notice he explains in verse 7, but if we walk in the light, not in behavior, 
not in good behavior, that's what this, but if we walk in the light, he is the light, amen? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sins. Sounds like the guy's witnessing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you say that there is no sin nature, okay, if you don't have one, then the truth ain't in you. And, and even in this case here, I have to double check it, but if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, who's in us? Christ. We have Christ on the inside of us, right? All right, now watch this, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's witnessing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, he's talking to somebody who's not a believer. Verse 10. Now, we're going to, guys, I'm going to move right into chapter 2 uh, when, we, when we do this. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He's talking to these guys who may for some reason say that they don't have a sin nature and they've not sinned. Verse 11, my little children, these things, now watch this very carefully. Now I submit to you that chapter 1 was a declaration to unbelievers about how they can now have fellowship with the Christ that these disciples have. That's pretty clear. See, right? Now look at verse, uh, ch chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, my little children. That's interesting. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. He didn't call them little children up there in chapter 1. Now we're talking about the children of God, thou little children. These things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's addressing his little children now. And what he says to his little children, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins or the substitute for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So now he's talking about a whole deal. He talks to these guys, dudes, you want to get saved. We've seen him. We've beheld him. And if you confess your sins, uh, he, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins so you can come and have fellowship with what we have fellowship. But now, my little children, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So now there's a distinction between you confessing your sins if you sin as an unbeliever. As an unbeliever, he says, let's get your life straight. Confess your sins. Confess Jesus. Make him Lord of your life. But it says, now as a child of God, you have something greater. Jesus has already dealt with your sin. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, my goodness. Also, for, you know, he, he's died for your sins. He's a propitiation. He's a, he's a substitute for your sin. He's taking care of your sins. And not only of your sins, here's an awesome thing. He said, while he died, he took care of the sins of the whole world if they would just come to the point of recognizing it and receiving what he's done for them. Amen. Now, here's what I want to show you. 1 John 1 and 9, we do not confess our sins in order to be forgiven uh, as a believer, as a believer. Now, now I'm talking to believers. I'm talking tonight to believers. Now, what did we do to get born again? We confessed our sins and we believed on him, right? According to the book of Romans, right? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with you in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We did that, right? But now that you're saved. <coughs> so the rest of the night, I'm talking to you now that you're saved, now that you're born again, all right? And, and, and here's what I want you to hear. We confess or speak openly to our gracious Father because we have already been forgiven. I've already been forgiven. I've already been forgiven. For me to say that I have to confess 
all of every sin, after I get saved, for me to, to say I've got to confess my sins in order for God to forgive me, forgiveness is not dependent on what I do, but on what Jesus has already done. And if I have to confess my sins in order to be forgiven, then it is dependent upon me confessing my sins to get forgiveness and not dependent upon what Jesus has done for me to get forgiveness. Now, that is operating under the law all day long because the pattern of the law is what you do to get God to do something versus what God has done to empower you to be able to get something. All right? So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. We talked about this last week and verse 10 and 14. Have our sins been taken care of as born-again Christians? All right, verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified. You know, it just gives me chills. Let's just start at verse 1. I love context. Context is cool. He said in verse 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So what he's talking about is the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament where they would bring the, the, uh, the, the, the um, blood of an animal to be sacrificed to cover the sins of the people. It couldn't get rid of sin, but it would cover it for a whole year. But they would have to come back year by year to try to get that same thing to happen. And um, it would continually do it. And he says all of the animal sacrifices in the world would never be able to give you a perfect conscience. Perfect here is referring to your consciousness, Hebrews 9 and 9, and not referring to sinlessness. Now look at verse 2. He says, For then would they have not ceased to be offered. If it could get rid of sin, it would have, you know, they would have stopped offering it. Because that the worshiper, once purged, should have no more consciousness sin, or he wouldn't have no more sin conscience. But he just said the sacrificial offerings could not get rid of sin, so you would always have a sin conscious. All right, verse 3. But if those sacrifices there is a remembrance that, but in those sacrifices there's a remembrance again made of sins every year, still sin conscious. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin, still sin conscious. Five, wherefore when he cometh into the world, he saith sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared. He's talking about his body. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Still talking about the old way of dealing with sin. Verse 7, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hath pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first way of dealing with sin, which was, what? The animal sacrifice, that he may establish the second way of dealing with sin, which was, what? The sacrifice of his body. Now look at what he says in, in verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified or made holy, how are we sanctified, set aside, set apart, no longer common with everybody else. How are we set aside? Through the body, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And he offered his body, what? Once for all. So check this out. The high priest that administered the animal sacrifices, the Bible says they could never sit down. There was never a chair in the holies of holies. They stood continuously making offerings that they knew would never be able to get rid of sin. But this Jesus offered his body once for all sin, glory to God, thank you, Jesus, and then he sat down, meaning he ain't got to do this no more. All right, now, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin, verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, which was what? No, what, what did he offer? His body. 
He, he offered one sacrifice for sin forever. For how long? Forever. forever. For how long? Forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. Question, is Jesus offering his body every day for a sacrifice for your sin? He did it how many times? Once. So he did it one time, and that's good for what? Forever. How long did that one-time sacrifice last? Forever. For what? Forever. So he died one time for your past sins, sacrificed his body one time for your present sin, sacrificed his body one time for all your sins in the future. Well, I don't believe he did it for all the sins in the future. Guess what? You were not born when he was on the cross, and what he died for back then took care of you in the future before you were even born. Yeah. So he took care of you and your future sin. <laughs> Somebody got that thing. <laughs> Almost made me start running when you did that little crow. <laughs> Do you see this? So when was sin dealt with? On the cross. What sacrifice was administered to deal with sin once and for all? His body. Have you seen his body back on the cross since? Where is, where is his body? S come on, seated well. Y'all better make me preach here, seated well. Could anybody else's body do what he did? So it should not have been you on that cross. Don't you ever sing that song? It should have been me on that cross. We'd have still been messed up if it would have been your body on that cross because you didn't have the blood he had. You got blood type O, blood type AB, blood type whatever, but he had blood type G. He's the only man that carried in his veins God's blood. Hallelujah. And his blood was the only thing that could deal with your sin. Come on, somebody give me an amen in this place. All right. Woo, Lord, I'm excited. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins, for that forever, after he did that, sat down. <laughs> On the right hand, of God. Yes. Excuse me where I'm going to ask this. Where that body at now? <laughs> where the body at now? The right hand of God. Somebody said, well, you know, I don't know. I never thought about that. It was in the grave. He got up on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. Somebody said, how you know the guy up? Well, you can ask some of his disciples. <laughs> Old Doubting Thomas said, I doubt it. <laughs> Jesus said, handle me and see. For a spirit has not flesh and bone. I said they said flesh and bone. What was the blood? Well, see, that was presented at the... That, that, that's the stuff that, that took care of your sin once and for all time. Hmm. Somebody said, what's in his veins now? You don't even want me to go get started with that right now, boy. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, verse 13. From henceforth, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. Yes. All right, verse 14. For by one offering, how many? One. He hath perfected, for how long? Yes. Them that are. Yes. Now look at this in the Amplified, this verse, verse 14. By one offering. And, and, and what was he talking about? Sin, right? Yeah. By one offering. For by a single offering, he has forever completely cleansed. So you go to 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you're telling me that I'm not cleansed until I, I confess it? When right here he says that with that one single offering, he has forever completely cleansed, past tense. I have been cleansed. I, I, I'm not cleansed when I confess my sins. I am cleansed the day I receive what he has done about my sins. I wake up cleansed. I go to bed cleansed. And even if I miss the mark, I'm, I'm totally, I'm so, I'm under waterfall of cleansing that what I did can't attach itself to me because I'm continually <laughs> The, the, this word cleanse, it, it's, in the, it's in a tense that means a continuous cleansing. 
nonstop all the time. It's not cleansed back then and it stopped. It's a continuous cleansing right now. Right now you under the waterfall of his promise. See, that's messing with y'all because you're still trying to figure out, yeah, but what about the sin? I'm telling you about the sin. It's been whooped. <laughs> the sin has been taken care of. And there's still somebody just still say, well, now, you know, what about sin? What about sin? Because what you're really thinking, here's what you're really thinking. Ooh, I, I can go on sin and enjoy myself. Here's what I can assure you. If you get this, you're not going to want to because the grace of God now will teach you how to live righteous. It'll te see this. Here, God told when it gets, when his, see, remember the grace is Jesus. When Jesus gets on the inside of you, he's going to start rearranging your furniture, changing your desires, the stuff you want to do, you ain't going to want to do no more. He's going to give you new want-tos. The apostle Paul did it like this in Romans chapter 6. Uh, he said, the question was asked, shall we continue in sin, the sin nature, that grace may abound? And Paul says, how can we? How you going to do that? You don't have a root that produces that no more. You're living under a waterfall being continuously cleansed. You've been changed on the inside. The stuff that used to be you and you ain't in you no more. How can we who are dead to sin continue there anymore? So we've, we've been cleansed by that one offering, and we've been perfected. Those who are consecrated and made holy. Now, when were you made holy? When you were born again, right? When were you consecrated? When you got in Christ, got born again, you were made holy, you were made sanctified. Holiness is not a conduct, it is a position in Christ. Sanctification is not a way to act, it's a position in Christ. It's who you are now in Christ and believing that from that root, from that center, comes the fruit that you now bear in your everyday life. I, I, I want you to hear me very carefully. I don't mind you going to God as an expression of your fellowship, talking to Him about the sin that you committed. But your confession of sin is never, ever going to be, I'm confessing sin so I can be forgiven. I'm already forgiven. Mm -hmm. If you confess sin, you know, you go before God. Here, here, here's what it looks like. Father, I made a decision, and, and, and I sinned, Lord, and I am so grateful that 2,000 years ago, you already forgave me for my sins. And, and I don't like the decision. I, I ask you to help me to make a better decision next time, but I just give you praise that I'm already forgiven, that I don't have to walk away condemned and beat up. Thank you, Lord. That I, so I'm confessing it, but not to be forgiven. I am confessing it because I'm already forgiven. Amen. Amen. All right, now, based on what I just showed you, I don't think you have a problem with the rest of what I'm going to Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and 7. This is where we got to stop vacillating because somebody's saying, this is just too liberated, too much liberation in that grace thing. <laughs> you dog all right. It, it, it liberates you from the bondage of the law. Amen. Now watch this. That's the whole, who said that? That's the whole purpose is to liberate you. And that's what I was thinking. Tell I said, that grace message is too liberal. You dog all right, you ought to try. <laughs> that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Liberate you. What does that mean? Set you free. Yes. Now look at this verse 7. In whom we have redemption, we've been redeemed, we've been delivered, we've been bought back, purchased back. How? Through his blood. And what about the forgiveness of sins? He says, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, not forgiveness of sin according to the riches of our confession, but through the riches of his grace. Now, if you have to confess in order to be forgiven, that's not grace because that means you had to do something in order to get something. Grace is favor 
where you don't do nothing to get it, but you believe that Jesus has done it, and through faith you receive it. Amen? Amen. See, the Bible doesn't say we live from confession to fashion, confession. The Bible says we live from faith to faith. Amen. Go to Romans chapter 1 and uh, 17. We live from faith to faith, not from confession to confession. See, we're trying to draw a doctrine around 1 John 1 and 9. Well, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, I believe you have to confess your sins because that's when you get rid of it. No, I believe that the day I confess my sin to get born again, and got saved, that's when I got rid of it. Amen. Amen. But Jesus got rid of it 2,000 years ago. He was just waiting on me to believe that I received what he did. Amen. Amen. Good. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now notice the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, not from confession to confession. It's not revealed, you know, oh, God, I, oh, Lord, I confess my sins today. No, it's, it's, it's revealed from faith to faith. What does he mean, faith to faith? It, it is revealed from faith, I believe, I receive unforgiveness, to faith, I believe, I receive unforgiveness, that I'm forgiven. I believe that I've, I'm, I've been forgiven from faith to faith, from believing to believing, from receiving to receiving. That's so we don't live from confession to confession. We live from faith to faith. Now, now let me play a little advocate here a little bit. Well, not really an advocate. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me go on the other side for a moment. Now, if you believe that you have to confess your sins as a Christian believer in order for God to forgive your sins, then make sure you confess everything now. Make sure you confess everything now. If that's what you believe, then you make sure you want to confess everything, and you got to make sure you confess this little scripture here in Romans chapter 14, 23, which I want to show you. Romans 14, 23. Because what we have a tendency to do when we talk about confessing sins, we only confess the big stuff. Oh, Lord, I, I confess I cussed out today, and I shouldn't have did it. I feel bad. Oh, Lord, I confess I did this. But now, listen to this. And he that doubteth is damned, and he that eateth because... He eateth not of faith, for whatsoever, that's a big word, is not of faith is sin. So that means all of the fear, all of the doubt, and all of the worry. So if you're going to confess your sins because you believe you have to confess your sins to get rid of it, you're going to have to confess your sin of worry, your sins of doubt, and, and uh, your sins of fear. So, you, if you, so, 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 so check it out. So let's just say you died. And, uh, you know, you forgot to confess those. And also, you got to confess the sin of speeding. <laughs> See, because now you're living by the law. You got to confess the sin of eating uh, pork. You got to confess the sin when you had a bad attitude. You didn't feel like talking to nobody. To know to good, do good and to do it not, you got to confess that sin. See, the way it looks like, if you believe that, you're going to have to be confessing all the time. Every time you look around, you're going to have to be confessing something under your breath. Oh, Lord, I confess that sin. I should not look at her like that. Oh, Jesus, I confess the sin. That thought that just came to mind, I just confess the sin. Oh, Lord, I confess this sin because I, 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 forgot. I could have did better, but I didn't do better. I didn't say, hey, Lord. I didn't say, hey, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I confess this sin. I'm worrying again. I'm worrying, Jesus. I come. Just go drive you crazy. You're going to be bipolar. You're going to need a pill. There's something that's wrong. This is not... This is not what he was talking about. You cannot believe that. This is not what he's talking about. And I am, I am prepared. I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm doing meetings now where I'm meeting with pastors in a round table and having to talk to these things that I hear them preach all about. And I'm going to say, all right, prove to me if you're going to do this now, then let's, you got to confess everything. Now, you got to confess Every, you got to go through all the thoughts, and you know how the devil is. He flies over your head. He might not build a nest, but he sure going to fly over your head. You got you gotta, you gotta, you gotta to confess all that flyby. <laughs> I should have pushed that lady in line. Oh, God, I shouldn't have did that. Oh, la la ba -sha, help me, Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. Oh, la la ba 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 -sha. And then you, you know, you, you single, you look at that woman. Man, that's a nice woman. 
baby got back to, oh, God, no, Jesus, help me. My eyes, I, 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 see, he, see, you believe that, but what about the part that says, pluck your eyes out? Won't you pluck your eyes out? Cut your hand off. Cut your hand. If that was the truth, if we really believed that, the church would be a bunch of folks with nubs. You know, we, we wouldn't have no hands to wave, no feet. We wouldn't have no eyes to see none. <laughs> Think about what we bought. They taught it, we bought it. Think about that, man. And think about, think about you going to heaven and showing God your sacrifice of confessions. Lord, I confessed it. And then he's showing up, he says, well, we got a whole list you forgot to confess. So should we let you in or keep you out? <laughs> well, what, what, what you talking about, Lord? Which ones I forgot? Well, you, we got a whole bunch of things where you didn't confess you went 56 miles an hour or 71, whatever speed thing we're in. So, you mean I'm going to go to hell for going one mile over? Well, you're the one who believe in confessing. I'm just telling you, you didn't have to do none of that. The same thing he did with the animal sacrifice. You didn't have to do none of that. But you insist on bringing these sacrifices to me when I gave you my son's body and blood and you continue to dishonor his body and blood and you want to do just like Job. What do you mean just like Job? You know, Job kept bringing, making altars, bringing sacrifices because he was afraid that his kids might have sinned against God. And so Satan was able to come in and destroy everything because he kept making those sacrifices and not just believe that God said, I got you. Well, isn't, isn't that the same thing? When you keep bringing your confession sacrifice because you don't believe that God's already dealt with it. And you know what happens? you eventually become so sin conscious because you're confessing sin all the time, and the word confession doesn't even mean, I wrote this down, the word confess in the Greek, homo log logio, which means to say the same as another, to admit to or to say the same as another. So if I'm going to confess something, I'm going to confess what he's already confessed. Amen. He said, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. He said, I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Whoa. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 19, I want to show you an illustration. The people in Corinth, the church of Corinth, they were not told to confess their sins. In fact, let me let you in on something. The apostle who was called to preach grace, Paul, in all of the epistles that Paul wrote, he never wrote one word about confessing your sins. You can't find it in the Bible. Not what Paul wrote. Paul, the, the guy that we just read, that was John. And John only said it one time. John said it one time. Now, if confessing your sins in order to get rid of your sins was a big deal, don't you think the guy who got the revelation to preach the gospel of grace, don't you think he might have mentioned that? Because if that was the truth, Paul shortchanged us and told us everything about grace except that we needed to confess our sins to get rid of it. We wrote all those epistles and didn't say one word about it? Something ain't right. <laughs> Something's not right. And I'm going to have to preach this to people who believe this. And they're not going to be like you guys. Oh, Pastor, we know you're right. Oh, hallelujah. They're going to be like, <laughs> I hate your guts to hell with you, preacher. <laughs> but they're not going to be able to turn to one epistle written by the Apostle Paul where Paul, don't you think that Paul would have said something about it? And he said nothing. Zilch. Nada. <laughs> but what did he say with the church of Corinth? He didn't say one thing to that church about confessing their sins. Instead, 
they were reminded that they were righteous. So when they sinned, he reminded them of their righteousness. He didn't say confess your sins. They sinned, and he reminded them of the righteousness. Look what he said here in verse 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring uh, 1 Corinthians 6, y'all. I was like, that ain't it. The wisdom of the ride and destroying somebody. That ain't a good start right there. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body, they're talking about fornication here. And look what he said when he was dealing with them about fornication. He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? This is what he said after the, the fornication deal, verse 20. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Did you see what he did? He put them in remembrance of their status. Did you? When they were talking about fornication, he didn't say, you got to confess that sin and get rid of it. He says, no, remember who you are. That's exactly what it meant. I believe in Galatians when he says, confess your faults one to another. That's not confessing your faults one to another so somebody can beat you up, beat your brains out, tell, tell you how awful you are, and make you get down and, and shout, you know, five hallelujahs, two yabba dabba doos, and three what's up gods. He did, that's not what that's for. It was constantly to say, if you confess your faults to me, my job is to remind you of the covenant that you're in and remind you that all is well and to remind you that you're not going to be thrown away and to remind you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth what his blood has accomplished for you, that he is faithful to his word, he's faithful to his blood, he's faithful to what his body was sacrificed for. And there's something that happens when you put people in remembrance of the covenant that they're walking in. Oh, my goodness. But you know what sin conscious will do? It will just bring you right back to the consciousness of sin. You know what happens when you're righteousness conscience? You lose all of that. You're not interested in operating in that anymore. And, and about fornication, he says, remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, glorify God with your body. It was bought with a price. Your spirit now is there. You're God's. What a ministry. What a ministry. That's a whole lot better than it goes up. It goes somebody say, what, you been fornicating? You hell-bound, <laughs> diseased sinner, you're going to hell. You're going, the judgment of God be upon you before 12 o'clock tonight. You're going to hell. 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 <laughs> you know what that does? That brings about condemnation which brings about guilt, which brings about shame, which brings about a cycle of sin. Yeah, do you remember the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, Lord, I'll say it. If you bought it up, I said I wasn't going to say this. Never unless he bought it up. The streets that Jesus were on that day, most of those streets were a stone. And especially where they were in the city because she was caught in that very act of adultery, they pulled her out. <sighs> this is so cool. So they said what the law said, a woman's caught in an act of adultery, she should be stoned. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He did something so interesting when they started telling him what the law said. He bent down. Remember the thing with the finger? I don't know why we thought he wrote in dirt, but he put his finger on stone, indicating I'm the author of the law. My finger on this. I'm the author of the law. Wow. And said, fine. If and one of y'all. 
<laughs> That's so college park, isn't it? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, what does it say am? <laughs> if there's anybody here today, that's what am mean. <laughs> if there's anybody here today that doesn't have any sin, proceed. Proceed. And every last one of them dropped it because they know they had some stuff, right? Then look what Jesus did. He went to his wo this woman and says, there's nobody here. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Now watch this now. Go and sin no more. Now look what happened here. He gave her a free gift that day. He took a woman who was obviously in shame and guilt and all of these things. And he says, I am going to give you a gift. It's called the free gift of no condemnation. The gift of no condemnation. With the gift of no condemnation, you are now equipped to overcome sin. Listen to me carefully. Wherever there is condemnation, out of condemnation will come fear. Out of fear will come more sin. I thought fear was the, the bottom line to that. Condemnation is. If a person walks and lives in condemnation, they will not walk in the rhythms of grace they will walk in the rhythm of sin. And they will try to stop sinning, and they will fail, and they'll get condemned, and they'll get fear, and they'll sin again, and they'll feel shame, and they'll feel guilt and condemnation, and they'll sin again, and a cycle comes, and it, it continues on. Why? Because whatever is built on condemnation will cause a cycle of sin to begin and to be maintained. But when you understand that there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, yes. period, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand, those of you who are born again tonight and you're in Christ Jesus, he is not condemning you. He is not mad at you. He's not in a bad mood where you're concerned. Do you understand that you're safe in him, that you're perfect in him, that you're righteous in him, that you're holy in him? And when he sees you, he sees Jesus? But as long as religion tells you that God condemns you, you're going to hell, that he's mad at you, that he's, he's having a problem with what you did. As long as you do that, you'll never be free from that sin. But the day you realize that he doesn't condemn me. And if he doesn't condemn you, don't you let somebody else condemn you. Don't you let somebody else condemn you. And that's how you stay free. Jesus has given me the free gift of no condemnation. And he said to this woman, with this gift, go and sin no more. That's how you do it. We got to be careful how we sometimes seem like we look forward to beating people up with their sin. We've got to provoke people to love. We've got to incite a love that's in Christ where Love covers a multitude of sin. You see, God knows what, that when people receive him, they're not going to keep sinning. I know this sounds so liberal that you think it's just an excuse for people to go on sinning. They're not. Because when you see how much he's forgiven you, then you're going to want to love him as much as the forgiveness that he's given to you. You're going to do it. You're going to, you're going to grow in love with this Jesus, man, because you see how awesome and how magnificent he is. 
I look forward every day with an opportunity to be able to minister to people about this gospel. I know how radical it is. I know what they're going through with religion. I was the chief of religious leaders. I was a religious preacher. I preached the law. I preached the mixture of the law. I preached bondage. I took a beautiful message like faith and turned it into legalism and told you about what you had to do this in order for God to do that. And I understand if I ever preach anything that says you have to do something to qualify God to do something, that is the pattern of the law. And I will not go back to that. And I'll tell you why I won't go back to that. Because Jesus, who is grace, yes. has moved in such a way in my life I can't even tell you how he's done it, but I am not the same because the grace of God has been leading me, directing me, and guiding me. Somebody says, well, how do you know the grace is worth? When there's no longer a need for you to defend yourself, protect your image, compete with anybody, when you can go around anybody and still be free and all right who you are, the grace of God has so invaded your life because now you're all right with who you are. I'm good to go. So this is not about dying and seeing if I'm going to get to heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm already in heavenly places. If you're good enough to have, go to heaven, you're good enough to have some heaven on the inside of you. I am so stirred up because of this Jesus who is grace and me understanding what he's already done. Here I thought that God needed me to do this in order for him to do something. Get real. I am no longer in the equation of God being able to do something. I am now the total recipient of his faithfulness and Jesus' faithfulness and his finished works. What do you think he was talking about when he said, it is finished? He was talking about this covenant of grace. We're free. We've been liberated from the bondage of the law and we're free to walk in the glorious manifestations of His grace. I'm going to do some teachings to show you how the Holy Spirit now operates, leading and guiding you in all of the truth of God's grace. And the Spirit of grace carrying out even portions of the covenant of grace your dependence and reliance upon your unseen partner as he wakes you up in the morning and whispers in your ear answers and comfort. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will just whisper, whisper something so simple like, I love you and all is well. And he knew that's exactly what you needed to hear. And he guides you throughout the day. So your relationship with God is no longer limited to a one hour time span a one hour of time spent in a closet. Now you walk with the Holy Spirit throughout the day. And you hear this part of you that sounds like your consciousness. And these words are coming up in your, in your mind and you're hearing things and you're like, where is this coming from? This is your unseen partner trying to minister to you today and show you things to come. And, and I, I hadn't heard it lately, but it's time for us to do some teaching on the present day operation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that he is not a Casper the friendly ghost that somebody used to talk about, but he's a very present help in the time of trouble. And if you will listen to him, He'll put you in remembrance of the grace of God. He comes to convict of sin, and the number one sin he comes to convict of is the sin of unbelief. He wants us to believe this covenant. He wants us to believe this. I believe it. I'm a believer. I believe it. I believe I was healed 2,000 years ago. I believe I was forgiven 2,000 years ago. I believe because he's forgiven me, I can forgive other people. Hallelujah. I don't have to walk around with the burden of other people's mess on my shoulder. I just forgive them. I forgive me. I forgive others. I forgive 
uh, folks who did. I forgive all of them. I, I, ain't hold, I ain't taking nothing with me but the glory of God's grace on the inside. I ain't taking all that stuff. Everything is all right. Sometimes you make big deals out of stuff ain't nothing. Let it go. And rejoice in the victory that we have in the grace of God. Now, hear me very clearly. You confessing to be open with your fellowship with God about your life, yeah, I think you can do that, no problem at all. Yeah, because you talk to the Holy Spirit. You talk to God, and you want to tell Him about things. But if you ever think that your confession is responsible for your forgiveness, I'm not confessing, I will never. You confessing your sins and me confessing my sin is just like bringing another sacrifice to the altar to get my sins. I'm going to confess my sins so God can do what He's already done? Seriously? He's already done that. So I'm not confessing to get forgiveness. I'm confessing because I am forgiven and that I have open fellowship with the Spirit of God. But Jesus has done the work. It is final once and for all times. I am under a waterfall of cleansing, and I walk with no condemnation, which means I'm able to lay hands on the sick and see them healed, and not lay hands on the sick and say, oh, I ain't been perfect enough. I should have prayed a little bit more. Oh, I should I forgot to fast. I need to fast every year for 60 days so I can go and brag to people about fasting. I'm going to tell you, there was a guy who fasted so much in a place I was going to, he was doing the meeting there. He died before I got there because he was fasting too much. <laughs> he wasn't eating. And you're not fasting out of the right motives. You're fasting for the wrong reason. You're fasting to try to get God to do something he's already done. You got to find the right reason for fasting. Hmm. Well, hallelujah, I'm free. I don't need to take the medication. I don't need to have the operation. And the Holy Spirit be talking to you. Go on, take it. I bless it. No, that ain't God. Yes, it is. And now you're dead because he said, your faith wasn't big enough to carry this thing. I had a pill there that would have knocked this thing out for you. But you didn't, you weren't hearing what I had to say because you were too deep and claiming you had a relationship with me and you didn't even know me. Because if you don't know me in grace, you don't know me. Right. I'm going to let this thing go because we finna go somewhere. Y'all ain't ready to go this thing with me. Now, grace convention. See, I don't understand. You please hear what I'm saying. It is a marvel to me of the abundance of revelation that's going to be shared in this place next week. I'm not missing a session. But now don't get mad at me when glory come on me. All right, you trying to figure out what I got to do. Listen, some things just you, 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 you're willing to pay for. I'm willing to pay for 25 sessions. After the 25 sessions, I'm going to have something. Amen. I don't know. What, I'm trying to get the whole church to participate. They just can't figure out, oh, I can't make it to no 25, Pastor. I might come to two. <laughs> that explains everything about your life. Right. It's the most important thing in the world to me. I'm going to hear something I didn't know. Or I'm going to hear something again that I didn't get it. Now I can get it the second time. But I ain't, I ain't no, ain't no, ain't no, I'm gonna miss that. Uh, well, Pastor, I will come, but I ain't got $25. Use your faith. Go to the doggone table anyway. We already got people who already done paid for people who came, came for it. $25, yeah, you, that might be a reality to you. But believe God, go to the doggone table anyway. I'm here to register for the convention, and I ain't got no money right now. What can y'all do? You don't know what's going to happen. That's the problem with folks. You sit there and let money stop you, and you got something more valuable than money. It's your faith. Use it. I think that happened Sunday. There was a few people came up to the table, register, and other folks heard them. They said, oh, I got you. And while I'm at it, he'll handle some more for five more if they come up. You, in this church, for real? Right. I apologize for that. I kind of like went off a little bit, didn't I? Because I know what it'll do. And once you get it, you're never going to be safe. Just by a show of hands, since you've been hearing the gospel of grace, has your life tremendously changed? It's, it's 
So would, don't you want to see that happen in somebody else's life? And here's the thing about it. We, had, we, we ain't even got the fullness of this whole thing. You mean there's more? Yes. Yes. There's more. There's a, there's a, there's a level of intimacy that'll change you from the inside out. And you won't even be able to offer up an explanation. Why do I have such peace? Hallelujah. How come this ain't bothering me like it used to? And there's a presence of the Holy Spirit that's undeniable. And you walking around healed, and the Holy Ghost got to remind you, hey, you remember that pain you had yesterday? Yeah. Notice it's gone. Sure is. <laughs> Boy, that's what I'm talking about. Christianity was never supposed to be a religion. Christianity was supposed to be a personal relationship between you and Jesus, and you're not supposed to feed from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're supposed to be feeding from the tree of life, and the tree of life is Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I got the apron on. Let me feed you. Let me feed you. This is what life is. It can be awesome. And if your life is not awesome now, we're pressing in on awesome. I ain't talking about, it's okay, awesome. I'm talking about awesome. Where when you by yourself, somebody better watch out when they walk in the room because you're having church all by yourself. I almost sung myself in tears this morning. Some little uh, simple prayer that I let the choir was saying, you know, if you only trust him, trust him, trust him. Good gracious of life. I said, Lord, have mercy. Then I started adding some more words to it. Oh, my God. And I kept singing and kept singing it. And I just couldn't get it out of my mind. Then I sit there in the kitchen and sang it. And and then I make my confession, I'm crying, and I'm singing it again. I sang it while I was in the shower and sung it while I was putting lotion on and sung it when I combed my hair. Somebody said too much information. Sung, I just, just, and I realized I'm just, I'm just, oh. Oh, and I could just see myself just trying to convince people, if you could just only trust him. Whew. My time up. I gotta stop now. Mm, mm, mm. My, my, my. So, do you have to confess your sins in order to be forgiven? No. Jesus has already forgiven you. Now, you do you have to confess your sins to be forgiven as a sinner? Yes. But as a believer, no. And I think that's the distinction that needs to be made. Lift your hands up. Father, we praise you tonight. We're, we're grateful. We're thankful. We're thankful for our Bible study times. We're thankful for our times that we can get in the Word, times that we can approach your throne. And I pray that something so supernatural has taken place on the inside of those who have been here today and those who are watching us over the stream, our other churches. I give you praise. Now, Lord, we receive the gift of no condemnation. Rise up strong on the inside of these precious people. Do something that is magnificent. Not that you've not already done it, because we know you have. But let the fruit now come forth. Bring forth the fruit of who we already are. We bless you, Jesus. We acknowledge you, Lord, and we release our faith right now. We honor you. In Jesus' name, let your presence flow in and out every row. 
heal, deliver, and make whole. We give you glory, Lord. All is well. We have no doubts. We have no fear. We cast all of our care on you. And with great peace, we leave this place in your presence, in your presence, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's put your hands together and give God a praise. Amen. Well, let's give an offering. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Let's give an offering. We will never allow the spirit of mammon to convince us to trust it more than we trust God. And we trust God. His influence is on our life. Therefore, his influence is on our giving. And I thank God that we are a people who love God to give, to honor the Lord. And this is an honor to him. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. And, oh, praise God. I just pray that you grab the joy of the Lord, yes. that you don't let the joy of the Lord pass you by while you stay settled in some foolishness. Get the joy of the Lord. Be happy. Figure out how to be happy. Enjoy the people that are in your life. And you know, while some people in your life, they don't always act right, that's all right. They'll be all right later on. Just, just forget about it and just love them anyway. Just love them anyway, bless them anyway, and just go on, and they'll get it after a while. And after a while, they'll figure out it ain't bothering them. Why in the world am I sitting around and let it bother me? No! Get all wrinkled up for no reason at all. Enjoy Jesus, praise God. And I'm telling you, I'm having the biggest time enjoying Jesus and enjoying you. Amen? Amen. If you're given by text, the information is on your screen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm, mm, mm. I have to really hold back, boy, but I'm, I'm telling you, so glad I had, we had an opportunity to talk about this tonight. Now, you got it now. You know what the deal is. I showed you scripture. God will show you even more. And um, it's got to be dealt with. It's got to be dealt with. I think another definition for confess is to admit it, right? You know? But what you admitting? Well, I'm admitting that I'm the righteousness of God. <laughs> I admit I'm the righteousness of God. I admit that I'm holy and sanctified. I admit that I'm redeemed, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hold your offerings up. Let's present it to the Lord. Father, we are grateful to give with cheer tonight. And we're thankful for the opportunity to sow this seed into the kingdom of God. And Father, we yield to your spirit. And I ask in Jesus' name that everything that concerneth this congregation, that you're perfecting it right now. We praise you for it. I speak blessings over this church. I speak blessings over their finances, over their family. And we thank you, Lord, that the will of God for everyone's life is their prosperity. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive this offering tonight. If you're giving by text, go ahead and hit the button. And good to have you here tonight. God bless you and thank you for being here tonight. We love our Bible studies and we're going to keep on having them because, Amen, this is a time of learning, a time of growing, and a great time of understanding. And I just love teaching God's Word to people who hungry to get it. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. If you're here tonight and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want you to make a good, solid decision tonight. I am not going to walk out of here the same as I walked in. So if you walked in a sinner and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you can walk out a saint. All that stuff about, well, we just sinners saved by grace, that's baloney. You understand? You are a new creation once you get saved by grace. You're not still a sinner. 
You know, if you were still a sinner after you got saved, then why get saved? That's bipolar, man. Something is wrong with that. Amen? And it doesn't match Scripture anywhere, okay? And so we live by the Word of God. But if you're not born again and you want to get born again, come to this altar. Give us a privilege of praying with you and lead you, lead you to the Lord Jesus. Secondly, if you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I'm telling you, tongues is a grace gift. And when you pray it, man, powerful things open up. And last but not least, if God's calling you to join this church on a Wednesday night or wherever you may be in the World Changes Nation, in New York and Houston, wherever you may be tonight in one of the churches, go ahead and make that decision. Let's get connected tonight in Jesus' name. So I've given to you three things, but you are a free moral agent. You're the only one that can make the decision. I pray you decide well. At this time, if you will please stand to your feet, everybody minister to somebody. Turn to your right, left, front, behind. Ask them the same things I ask. If they need some help in coming down, help them come on down. congregation let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise if any of you responded in our other churches just follow those guys to the prayer room they're going to minister to you give you a biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you can receive and you'll never be the same again we're proud of you and we love you and we thank God for you now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present your faultless before the almighty God be glory majesty dominion and power both now and forever and everybody said Amen. Amen. Go by and register for the meeting next week. God bless y'all.